hello and welcome to uh, the fourth session of this year's material world se uh, series which is organized by uh, the Warburg Institute specifically by my PhD student Louisa McKenzie and myself um, but today will be run largely from uh, the historical uh, city of Exeter. Uh, now that city was uh, bombed a number of times during World War II, uh, most heavily in April uh, and May of 1942. Uh, that latter bombardment was part of what is ironically referred to as the Baedeker Blitz after the, uh, the, the German brand of tourist guys, because there were bombardments specifically designed to hit historical monuments. Uh, but little did the Nazis know that uh, apart from destroying uh, historic cultural heritage, they were also going to expose them. Um, because as part of, uh, well, in the rubble, uh, that was uh, the result of the bombardment, uh, uh, an important find was made. Um, of uh, historical wax, uh, late medieval wax uh, votive gifts from a tomb. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Specifically, uh, we're going to have three speakers. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Anne Barwood from Exeter Cathedral, who will uh, give us a little bit of uh, background about the role of the, the cathedral in the finding preservation of uh, these votive gifts. Uh, then we'll have uh, Naomi Howell from Exeter University, who uh, uh, teaches uh, medieval literature and is interested in the relationship between literature and material culture. And she will talk about the, the, the history of the objects uh, and so on. And after her presentation, there will be a short period of uh, to uh, allow for questions. And then we'll move to the last speaker, uh, Graham Verde, also from the um, University of Exeter. Uh, and he will talk about the, uh, the digital uh, photographing of the object and specifically also the uh, uh, 3D modeling of reproductions of the objects. Uh, so today's session will be both about the historical objects themselves and about their conservation uh, and about their display and presentation um, because they're, they're quite fragile. So um, in, this, in this particular case, conservation and display um, have uh, very well particular demands. Um, so I'm now going to hand over first to Anne Barwood from Exeter Cathedral. Anne. Thank you. Greetings from the team here in Exeter. First of all, can I thank the Warburg Institute for giving us the opportunity to share some of the cathedral's treasures and an even bigger thank you to my colleagues, or can I call them friends, Naomi and Graham, for joining me in telling you our story of how we take advantage of research of our treasures and how we conserve the ones that have become too fragile to handle or put on display for any length of time. The cathedral has a memorandum of understanding with the University of Exeter and particularly we work with the College of Humanities in providing learning research sessions when the opportunity arises and also into research that will enable us to have increasing knowledge about our collections, which is what actually happened concerning the wax votive figures. Naomi, who is a regular user of the Cathedral Library with her students, was involved with her husband in the HERA research program, Deploying the Dead which examined historic and prehistoric remains and related artifacts in order to shed light on their role and contemporary society. Naomi and her husband approached us, uh, i.e. via the library and into the cathedral to see if we would support their research and particularly their interest in the wax votives. 
it was this research program that paid for the figures to be photographed and some 3D models to be produced. Graham, who is a member of the research IT team at the university, which is actually based in digital humanities, leading on 2D and 3D digitization, was the automatic person to engage in the photography of the wax votives. They were actually at the time at the local museum under uh, security and, and conditions for their 10 year condition survey. So we knew it was a safe way of getting the photographs undertaken. We are aware that these wax votive figures are most probably the only ones remaining in England. And as Rembrandt has said, it was in 1943 when one of the cathedral masons involved in the repair of the cathedral following it being hit by a bomb the previous year, found the votive figures hidden behind the cresting in the masonry over the tomb of Bishop Edmund Lacey. There were over a thousand fragments in total with just one whole figure of a woman and the rest of animal and human parts. Some with their strings still attached from being hung round Bishop Lacey's tomb. Bishop Edmund Lacey was in fact a friend of Henry V and was his chaplain as Agincourt and one of his executors. Towards the end of his life, he became lame and infirm and following his death in 1455, miracles were said and devised to be done at his tomb whereupon pilgrimages were made by the common people. It has been said that had it not been for the Reformation, Exeter might have had a St Edmund. The cathedral continues to welcome pilgrims when it can, and it's good to be able to introduce them to how history is also part of our contemporary society and our work as a, as a cathedral. You might be interested to know that at the beginning of the pandemic, one of our visitors came and asked if they could pray at Bishop Lacey's tomb. Back to you, Brandbrand. Thank you, Anne, uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Naomi Howell now. Just a few uh, remarks regarding uh, Zoom. Um, first of all, there is a, a, a subtitle facility. If you don't want it, you can switch that off using the CC button uh, that has the live transcript uh, at the bottom of your screen. And the other thing is that for questions after the paper, um, we would like you to use the blue hand function. Uh, you can do the raise, raise hand either using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen or if you have an older version of Zoom, it will be uh, in the participants menu that you can open also on the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, please don't use the chat function uh, if you can avoid it because uh, that, that will make just things very quick. Wait, will make things just very confusing uh, if, we, if we get both questions via chat and uh, live. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to uh, Naomi Howell, who is going to talk to us more in detail about the Exeter find. Naomi. Yes, hi, I'm about to share my screen, um, but I just, before I, before I lose sight of everyone, I just wanted to uh, share a few of these wax votives, I'll be mentioning them briefly. This is actually what I had made um, oh, about 15 years ago when the wax votives, well, they still are very uh, delicate, very difficult to access. And um, I made this for my students to handle and it was quickly used um, by the cathedral, by some of the guides. And um, it just became very clear very quickly that it would be wonderful to have um, you know, something more detailed, something more precise to give a really great sense of, um, uh, of, of these marvelous objects. Um, I've set up 
some other of the um, reproductions which come from various sources and activities uh, behind me. You can ask me more about them in the question. All right. Just sharing my screen. And there we go. So just to give you a little sense of uh, what we're talking about, and um, Graham will show you much higher quality images, um, and I'll show you some more of the process that we um, that we uh, uh, did to photograph them. So I want to thank you all for coming to this event. I know I have um, colleagues from uh, China and Washington DC, California and Kenyan in Ohio and um, Boston as well. So thank you for coming as well as um, people who have been um, really incredibly helpful and uh, especially um, the Cathedral Library and Archives, uh, Diane Walker, uh, guides, people who know much more about this place than I think I ever will. So I'm very conscious that um, present are people who have various specialisms that, um, you know, will know more about their fields than I do. And all I can really hope to do is to um, introduce them to uh, express my gratitude for this kind of collaborative work um, that has brought them back to light um, and also maybe give a sense of the kinds of collaborations, activities, identities that gave rise to them to begin with. So as Rembrandt mentioned, um, <clears throat> uh, they were discovered in the wake of the Bedecker raids um, and looking for bomb damage. Um, so, by, <laughs> so um, yeah, and it's really uh, my delight to, to be able to uh, tell you uh, things that you may already know, but uh, here I go. So, um, so these uh, late medieval wax objects, now unique in the U UK after the Reformation, um, have hands, little people, animals, uh, as Anne mentioned, and they would have been a common sight in many churches. We'll have a glimpse at that in a moment. 500 years ago, these objects would have surrounded and adorned the tomb of Bishop Edmund Lacey. Uh, not Saint Edmund Lacey, but almost. <laughs> he was a bishop whose reputation for sanctity um, attracted veneration and pilgrimage to his tomb in the late 15th and early 16th centuries. In his lifetime, uh, Lacey's patient suffering in the face of serious health problems just um, attracted empathy and admiration. That's another thing that um, we might experience when we uh, look at these or reflect on them. Um, after his death in 1455, Lacey was buried in a tomb in the North Choir Isle, and the tomb was once adorned with a brass effigy of which only the silhouette now remains. Although he was never officially canonized as a saint, the tomb soon became a site of pilgrimage and people from throughout the Southwest made pilgrimages to this place until the Reformation and left votive offerings of which incredibly this hoard, this treasure trove has survived. In this short talk, I'm gonna take you back in time and then forward again. That is, I'll be saying a few words about how these unique objects were rediscovered, and then I'll speak about how they came to be concealed 400 years um, before they were discovered. Um, I'll then discuss the uses and meanings objects like this had for people in late medieval England. And hopefully I'll be able to talk about some of the current projects, which really um, provide incredible insight into past experiences, as well as present ones. We know even um, right now with COVID where we're all Zooming and hardly having that direct haptic interaction with objects, places, and people. Um, and yet these photos actually came out of a desire um, for things like that, for, uh, for health that was um, lacking or um, simply a desire or well-being 
and um, connection with loved ones, distant for whatever reason. Um, so, in 1942, the city of Exeter and Exeter Cathedral suffered significant bomb damage as part of the Baedeker raids. When the cathedral was being surveyed for damage in, 14, in 1943, a bundle was discovered up sort of hidden in the canopy, uh, which rises over the tomb of Bishop Ed Edmund Lacey in the North Choir Isle. Together with numerous shells and fragments, uh, the bundle contained more than a thousand wax fragments, many broken into small pieces, um, some of them sort of fragmentary in their original intentional form, um, but including instantly recognizable animal forms, human body parts, um, and one complete female figure. Um, we recently in Exeter, uh, and those of you maybe far away might have heard about this, we recently had a sense of what those Baedeker raids implied and why uh, a year later in 1943, they were still checking for bomb damage. Um, this uh, was a few weeks ago when a World War II uh, Perman bomb was discovered in Exeter and we felt the shockwaves throughout the city. Um, many buildings at a, some distance um, suffered serious damage. So I've mentioned a little bit about the haptic qualities, um, the sense of recognition that we can get from looking into the past through the lens of these votives. I've also briefly mentioned their fragmentary nature. Um, and you'll see that some of these, well, some of these heads are complete. Some of them have broken apart. You can see um, if you compare them, that many of them were made using the same molds and subsequently modified and um, uh, sort of customized to reflect individual um, identities, emotions, and um, well, whatever, whatever it was they wanted to represent. We also see, and you see this in the lower right-hand corner of this sort of collage, um, that we can um, find out information as varied as, for example, fashions. This particular headdress would have uh, belonged to a married woman, unlike the, the, the lady um, who survived. Um, the lady who survived is clearly unmarried because her head is uncovered. It's got a beautiful plait in the back. But this headdress of this, um, this lady, this married woman, um, reflects actually styles I haven't been able to find uh, in high status paintings of this time period, um, but instead in the Low Countries. So again, there we get a sense of Exeter's connections uh, by a trade uh, through the wider world. Many of you, if you um, are, as I know some of you are specialists in classical votives, um, you'll also recognize um, very strikingly some of those forms um, that seem to have existed either again or in continuity in the late Middle Ages. Here we have a collection of hooves, but I believe we have the, may have the point of a shoe there. Here's that, here's that lady with the headdress or another one. And um, again, perhaps one of those shoes. It's a beautiful horse. And it's been often commented that these um, animals were important to the livelihood of the pilgrims bringing them to the shrine, asking for the saints' um, care, intercession for their healing and well being. Um, but it's actually quite interesting as well that um, they can also reflect, I don't think we should discard, but they could reflect also emotions. There's a wonderful. Um, anecdote described uh, by Sarah Blick um, in her article um, <clears throat> about, uh, about an account of William of Canterbury describing uh, what one pilgrim named Cecilia uh, did when she arrived uh, at, the, at Canterbury at the shrine, she and her husband. She bought a pound of wax near the martyr's tomb and taking the wax she fashioned 
seven, seven shapes, uh, maybe seven candles, each one each for her, her husband, and five of their six sick animals. Seeing her lay them out, her husband lamented that there was not enough for another candle so that they could all be covered by Thomas's blessing. That's the saint they were visiting here, or it would be Edmund's. They left the shrine, and when they returned later, miraculously, they found an ace. So that missing one that was provided by divine intercession um, included the entire family, including their animals. So we get a sense of um, an emotional connection across species and um, across classes, across from the living and the dead, and across geographical distances. The social and spiritual meanings of wax are numerous. Um, there's a wonderful account of, um, uh, of, of a sermon uh, in which the wax is described as Christ, the wick of a candle, and these objects also all have wicks uh, to hang them with. The wick represented the Holy Spirit because it was invisible, and the flame uh, represented the Godhead. So you can see the multi um, valence, the multiple associations brought uh, with the materials and forms of these objects. And it might be worth remembering that Aristotle, who was much repeated and studied in the Middle Ages, um, also used wax as an image of what happens with the senses, that they are some kind of intermediary. They receive impressions, although they don't receive the materials of their impression. So among its most common uses, um, sorry. Um, yeah. So it's understood that these wax votive offerings, and this was quickly understood after their discovery, and they had pro proliferated before the Reformation, and they can still be found in devotional practices in many countries. This is an example of a late antique um, uh, votive offering. Many of them look much more like our votives. Um, however, this one is interesting because it has a empty space and it's been suggested that um, that would have been for wax so that it too could have been customized. So we have anthropomorphic representations um, throughout um, on, on many scales and throughout sort of um, medieval belief and understanding. Um, even the cathedral itself, this is Exeter Cathedral um, is an anthropomorphic shape, as you will remember. Lacey's tomb would have been just on the crown of Christ's head uh, in this picture. So pilgrims would have acquired the wax uh, or the entirely already made vo votives and would have entered the cathedral. Uh, you can perhaps discern my little arrow very thin, but it's pointing behind the high altar on the screen on the north side where Edmund Lacey's tomb would have been. And that's approaching. And here um, we're standing in the holy, holiest of areas of the cathedral and um, the high altar is just peeking out on the right. And the tomb of Ed Edmund Lacey um, would have been glittering uh, with objects, with votive offerings, much more precious than these wax votives, silver, gold, jewels, um, textiles of various kinds. Um, and yet when they were removed in the Reformation, um, those things were accounted for. The precious objects had to be given to be melted down. Um, the authorities had their eye on them. But the wax votives, though they're precious in a sense because beeswax was very wet valuable, um, yet they could fly 
under the radar. And um, yeah, one of my students wrote a beautiful uh, poem about that. Maybe I'll have time to uh, talk about that at the end. So they were actually found, as I understand it, in that sort of crevasse, that open <laughs> uh, space above the screen. Okay, so in 1537, in the early years of the Reformation, the zealous Protestant reformer Simon Haynes arrived in Exeter as the new dean of the cathedral. He instantly found himself in conflict with the can canons and uh, who were more of a more traditional uh, mindset. Haynes wrote to Thomas Cromwell, on my arrival here, I inquired of my brethren in the chapter house for the injunctions left by the king's visitors in order to see them put in execution. No one present knew who had them. And quote, if I had them, it was said, um, it, if I had them, it was said that they purported nothing else that, but that we should do as we have done in past times and live after the old fashion. Now, that sounds very improbable, right? But you can, anyone who's familiar with 198 modes of resistance, a wonderful uh, study in the 1970s, um, will know that dragging your feet is a very, very important mode of resistance. Um, so he, he says, uh, he asks for another copy of these injunctions because he wants to uh, put them into effect. Um, and he has sign, sign them with, their, with your own hand as you would uh, have them kept by this cathedral church and other life, and I will see them executed within this close. Um, I like the people of this town very well, says Simon Haynes, but as far as I have seen, the priests of this country are of a strange kind, uh, very few of them well persuaded or anything learned. And later on uh, in the conclusion of that passage, um, he says uh, that it's a, it's a dangerous place and to send reinforcements. So in the 1530s, Haynes made a number of drastic changes to the fabric and ornamentation of the cathedral. According to a complaint later lodged by the canons, uh, Haynes had defaced several beautiful images of saints, blotted prayer books, extinguished holy lights, removed and seized, seized brass and iron. So seized them, right? But not wax brass and iron belonging to the church and damaged the very architectural stability of the cathedral with his attacks on the fabric. Among these attacks in 1539 or 40, Haynes had the railings removed from the tomb of Bishop Lacey in the North Choir Isle and his brass effigy prized away from the tomb. The aim was to put an end to the local cult, which Haynes would have dismissed as papist superstition and all these adornments and gifts of devotion um, would have been so much popish trash. The antiquary John Leland, who visited Exeter Cathedral in 1542, made a note, Lacey, whose tomb Haynes, Dean of the Cathedral, defaced. So we know where Leland stands. With the removal of the railings, the wax votive offerings, which pilgrims had hung over the tomb, um, would were necessarily swept away. They should no doubt have mel been melted down or destroyed, but instead someone, some anonymous person, um, we'll never know who, hid them away uh, in that cord with uh, fragments of shell that was discovered 400 years later. They could not save the precious objects, the iron or the brass, but they saved the most ephemeral substance of them all, the wax. The surviving votive offerings, small figurines made of beeswax, are unique and eloquent in a number of ways. In fact, uh, Natasha Johnson, my, my pupil, writes from the perspective of that anonymous uh, hider of the votives. Um, and each one of these votives would have been brought by people whose names are long forgotten, whose stories can only be guessed at, but they're all the more uh, powerful for that. 
Unlike the costly and enduring monuments of the wealthy and the powerful, they offer us a glimpse into the beliefs and concerns of, the, of common people in the late medieval period, offering precious insights into their spiritual lives. In many cases, the wax votive figures probably represent a prayer for healing. And wax has long associations. In fact, it's still used for votive offerings uh, in the Mediterranean and uh, the Orthodox churches. Um, in fact, it's also used for healing. It's um, got antiseptic qualities and a sort of beneficent aroma. Honey was often used in medicine as well. In fact, we know that uh, Verrocchio, a sculptor and painter of the Italian Renaissance, um, worked on wax votive offerings as well as votive offerings of other kinds, such as you see some of them displayed here in this uh, in this church. Um, and in fact, he also worked with a doctor who um, who had a young woman who was extremely skilled at making these wax figures, and um, she also made. Um, models, anatomical models. In fact, this doctor became known as the, the first anatomist. But I don't remember his name, I have to look it up. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so human figures and body parts might have been thought to arouse this bishop's sympathy since he too suffered physical ailments. Afflicted animals and animal parts essential to the livelihood of the pilgrim were also humbly surrendered to his care. These wax objects are local representatives of a Europe-wide culture um, from antiquity, but certainly in the later Middle Ages. As Megan, Ho Megan Holmes has written of a study of ex, -voto of ex votos, wax seems to have been especially popular in the 11th century, becoming even more widespread in Europe in the 13th and 14th century. Wax anatomical ex votos fragmented the human body into critical functioning and malfunctioning parts, heads, eyes, teeth, chests, breasts, arms, hands, legs, feet, hearts, swaddled babies, in large, small, and medium sizes, according to an inventory from one sanctuary uh, ex voto shop. And we have historical records of silver uh, ones throughout this uh, throughout the UK as well. Um, mass production with molds facilitated the growing demand for this type of ex voto throughout Europe. Now, this is something that uh, would be a future project. Um, my uh, artist colleagues at Honey Scribe would love to, um, if we can get funding, uh, create out of these digitized models that. Uh, Graham is talking about to make actual molds and then we can use beeswax because um, that has particular translucent uh, aromatic um, tactile qualities uh, that make it really quite an important factor in these models. Wax was also a medium of seals legitimizing insignia affixed to documents bearing the imprint, the very traces of physical contact of an authorizing stamp of, of, of office. Now this um, uh, could be a whole separate lecture, all of Shakespeare's references to wax, where he plays on the words of wax and the accretion that is involved in its, uh, in its modeling. So waxing, growing, and um, also when people break seals, we have, I don't know, five different instances where they say, with your permission, wax, and then they open their letter. Um, and you can see, well, uh, you'll see on a later slide, but um, many wax offerings actually took the, took the shape of a wax seal as well. And th there you have a spectrum with um, other kinds of pilgrimage badges and um, objects that were made with impressing one form against another. So I think that's very symbolic as we receive the information that these material objects bring to us. So you can see, oh yeah, here's another, this is now, in, this is in Cologne. I wasn't able to get a good uh, full image, but you can see this is the relics of Saint Severin, Severin and the, um, uh, this is them being displayed, and in the background you can see that the 
the city was besieged and after these relics were be displayed um, along with all the pilgrims uh, votives that you see hanging above the shrine, um, uh, the saint interceded, his hand, his divine aid was felt because the siege was lifted. Here's another example of how they might have been displayed. Um, this is the um, this is the altar of Santa Margarita. It's the school of Torino Vanni um, and is in the Vatican today. But as you can perhaps see, and if you can make out my little line showing what part of that beautiful gold golden um, altar of Saint Margaret this is, even these fragments obviously they're understood to represent yes the functioning or malfunctioning part of the human body, but they are also sort of metonymic. They also represent much more than that. They, a uh, very interesting um, uh, study has uh, actually, it's an essay called The Medium is the Message, talks about how we really need to consider these offerings on a spectrum of devotional practices, which include the pilgrimage. So even in Exeter, we have an outline of a foot very similar to uh, a, sh a stylish shoe um, that we have an ex-votive votive of. So we see the, the whole action of creating, bringing, donating, leaving these behind and um, trusting in the saints sort of reciprocity um, that, that happens. And it's understood to be part of a wider whole. So much as bees were understood to live in a society of a collaborative society, um, where each one contributed uh, an essential part. Um, so we can see these wax votives are also sort of parts of holes, even in the representations on these shrines that are part of something much bigger, um, uh, often very much associated with that place as well as travel to and from it. And of course, um, they reflect as I mentioned, popular culture. This is uh, a little procession um, in uh, depicting villagers on their way to church, bringing candles uh, for candle mass probably. And this is uh, Sankt Wolfgang and Pipping in, near Munich. Um, and again, you see people with various ailments, visible and invisible, um, pilgrims bringing and leaving these offerings, uh, sort of to remind the saint of their presence, of their request. Um, you see the variety of sizes of colors, and you can clearly see that these are wax. Now, this is a particularly interesting image. There are more. I've highlighted the wax of votives there. Um, now, this is a fresco in a, on a wall painting in a, a northern Italy. And um, here you can see how um, people might have acquired these. So it's very fascinating. And again, it speaks to the medicinal uh, properties of bees and wax and honey um, that often chandlers and apothecaries were sort of grouped together in one guild. And here you see, this is an apothecary and um, he's selling wax votives. As, so, if you have something that ails you, you might get a medicine, you might see a doctor and a wax votive, right? And you also see hanging, and these are in red wax, the sort of seal impresses um, that would have also served as votives or badges, uh, probably votives. This, um, this is, oh, I wonder if you can see it, uh, but, the, the little woman on the right hand side um, in the green um, is selling wax votives along with other people sort of there are beggars there's a holy uh, crucifix on the just just above her um, and you can see this attracts coin. now coins also um, and of course in the reformation this is all attributed to greed and you know not to say that that was never an aspect of these um, these economies. Nevertheless, um, those too could be votive offerings. And here again, you see that this is only a small part. This is, of course, Bruegel's um, uh, battle between Carnival and Lent. And in fact, the image 
uh, sort of reflects um, uh, sort of the entire um, holy season from Mardi Gras to uh, certainly to Palm Sunday. You see some of the ladies there holding branches for Palm Sunday. You see all kinds of women at work, people working together as well as coming into conflict uh, and doing strange things. So, Yeah, I'll just go back to that for a moment. So one of the fascinating things that struck me as sort of particularly relevant um, was the way in which wax could be used as a mode of communication, as, um, as a medium, as something that you could um, have in common with many other people and yet form with your particular hands. And anytime you handle um, beeswax, you know that it sticks to you. Uh, even once I was able to ha handle um, one of those, uh, one of these votives. And in fact, when I handle um, this beeswax, my, my hands are full of that residue. Um, they also absorb the incense smoke, um, all the scents around them. So, um, so they carry these meanings for us. And it's no accident that people have responded to them um, really, uh, really po in powerful ways. They could communicate uh, with the divine. They could express the, the wishes and desires of those uh, of distant countries and distant times uh, and express bonds between the living too. One person could go on a pilgrimage for another, for example. Um, so there's an interesting moment in Timon of Athens. It's just one of the many Shakespeare quotes I'll, I'll, I'll share with you um, because it strikes me that it sort of has a relevance for um, uh, what, for some of the potentialities um, of these wax votives of thinking about them with them and being able to handle them and interact with them. So um, the character uh, in Shakespeare, uh, the character in Timon of Athens is bringing news of Timon's death, but he's seen the tomb and, uh, but he's illiterate. So he's not sure what it says, but he takes a wax impression of the information he wants to convey, right? So he says, my noble, my noble general, Timon is dead, entombed upon the very hem of the sea and on his gravestone, this showing the wax, this in sculpture, which with wax I brought away, whose soft impression interprets for my poor ignorance. So the wax interprets what we can't always understand. And this is what makes it so essential to be able to interact with these objects because every person, we know not just every scholar, but every individual has sort of and a different observation. One person will notice the scent, one person will notice the lightness, um, one person will notice, um, for example, uh, what it recalls to their mind in very uh, sort of profound ways. So thinking about wax votives, the objects left at Lacey's tombs as messages and messengers for the pilgrims either suffering with a particular ailment or simply suffering from, you know, mortality, um, the, the, the difficult, the painfulness of life, um, and connecting that with how we've, how we've been doing the work we've been doing, the collaborative work we've been doing on this project. Um, we've taken these impressions, and of course, they're by the technologies of photography um, that we can then make these models and transmit them and think with them. So um, I, I've been working, one of the wonderful projects that's come out of the digitization of um, the wax photos is uh, my colleagues um, at HoneyScribe. Uh, Amy Shelton is uh, an artist who has worked with Cancer Force and uh, in children's schools. Um, doing uh, exhibits in the library of these objects. Now, these are not people who have ever made uh, wax votive before. 
Um, and yet they interacting with these objects, these things that will be represented outside themselves. Um, many of the people commenting on the activity said how it took them out of themselves. It really allowed them to think of their whole self. Um, some of the women who had had, uh, you know, cancer survivors who had had uh, double mastectomies envisaged themselves as, you know, as, as they were um, before, not because of nostalgia, but simply sort of making that a reality that is that exists alongside their contemporary reality. Um, many of them envisage themselves with loved ones um, who they weren't physically with at that moment. Many children, children of immigrants um, interacted with these wax, with the 3D model and created their own uh, beeswax models um, in, in a way that also recalled where they came from and allowed them to give something, establish themselves in this place. So this is the exhibit. Ah. And um, obviously each of these has its own stories. Um, again, this uh, person who created the wings of an angel on their figure, um, you know, one of the things that has been observed about the lady is that she's a maiden. She's, you know, she's made of wax. Um, she probably does represent a real person, a real body. And yet she looks strikingly like representations of um, the human soul. So, Just to read you a few lines from my student's beautiful poem. This is Natasha Johnson. Um, she says, uh, she talks about the pristine chapels and uh, the, the impact of the Re Reformation with noses lopped off and heads chipped away, the mirrors bleached of their stains, the benches blanched of their smells, tokens clash with clinking bells, um, and then just the array of destruction. And I'll just read this moment speaking from the point of view of the person who hid the wax votives uh, all those hundreds of years ago so that we have them now. But there's a girl, small, waxy, worthless to us. Her eyes don't stare, her lips won't speak, even when her elders smashed and stolen, sing. Silent stirrer with palms touching and unveiled hair stuck to her dress, no, I begin to melt in her presence, cherished child of former times. How can I help this little thing hide? So uh, I'm now going to hand over to, um, to Graham Faraday for his presentation on the digital uh, photography and mod uh, 3D modeling uh, <coughs> after the, uh, uh, the wax exposures in Exeter. Great. Um, well, I'd like to start with a couple of thank yous to, to Rembrandt and Louisa for um, inviting us along to, to talk about this today. It's always it's always lovely to have the opportunity to talk about the work we do. Um, and also, obviously, to Naomi and especially to Anne at the Cathedral um, for the opportunity to be involved in this project at all. Um, as Anne mentioned, we've we've worked on a number of different projects with them at the Cathedral. Um, and it's it's always it's always lovely to be able to work with the team there. So um, um, Without further ado, I will move on. Um, so uh, my, my involvement in this project um, was very much on the, the technical side of things. Um, just to very, very briefly give a bit of a description of where I work. Um, I'm part of the digital humanities team at the University of Exeter. Um, the, the facilities we've got there, the digital humanities lab, it was a 1.2 million pound investment um, from the university into humanities research um, and particularly with a view to um, bringing the technology and the techniques that, that we, we can um, to enhance the humanities research. Um, so among the facilities we've got in the DH lab, um, we've got uh, studios equipped with state-of-the-art equipment for um, 2D and 3D digitization work. Um, we've got a seminar room with a big um, video wall, which is fantastic for kind of displaying the, the work that we do. 
Um, and we've got an AV studio. We do a lot of work with academics around um, recording oral histories, producing videos, podcasts, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a really wonderful facility and it's, it's the facilities like this that enable us to do the work, the work that we do. Um, so the first thing to talk about is, is why, why do we digitize objects? What's, what's the, the benefit of um, producing digital replicas? Um, one of the key um, reasons is for preservation. Um, it allows the study of the objects that we're interested in um, without the originals being handled. Um, and as Naomi has talked about, um, and, and Anne as well, the, the wax votives and a lot of the other objects that we work with are incredibly rare, incredibly fragile, um, and any handling risks degrading them, damaging them. And you know, as, as Naomi said, it's impossible to touch the, the wax votives without you know part of that wax coming away on your fingers and, and you know kind of leaving the imprint on them. So the more that can be done to minimize the amount of contact that's required to study them, um, the, the better for kind of their long-term preservation. Um, it's also about increasing accessibility. Um, these objects, the wax votives, are held in the collection at the cathedral. Um, and as Anne said, you know, they're, they're occasionally out for, uh, they're able to go out on display, but only under very controlled circumstances. Um, what we can do by digitizing them is make them available to a much wider audience. We can make these models, um, we can put them up online, and we can really kind of spread the word about them and, and make them accessible to a, a much wider audience. Um, there's also a conservation act aspect to it. Uh, part of this work obviously involves taking detailed photos of the object. That allows uh, and, and provides a very detailed record of the current condition of the, the objects, the votives. Um, so that, you know, in 10, 15 years time, when further conservation work is done and assessment of their condition is made, um, we've got that detailed record of the, their condition at this point in time. So we can see whether they're degraded further or whether the conditions that they're, that they're being kept in are, are, are kind of doing a good job of preserving them. So um, a little bit about Sorry, I've just had a message pop up that my screen isn't shared. I thought I'd done that. Um, is that better? Can you see it now? <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. <laughs> Thanks Rembrandt for pointing that out. Um, so uh, the next thing to talk about is, is how we go about digitizing objects in 3D. Um, the, the principal technique that we use is called photogrammetry. Um, as a technique, it's as a technique, it's uh, referred to as structure through motion. Um, you're taking a set of photos um, from a large number of angles around an object. Um, obviously, working with smaller objects, um, and you can see kind of the, the typical setup we'll use for smaller objects there with the camera on a tripod um, and the object on a turntable. We'll position the camera relative to the objects and then we'll take a photo, rotate the object on the turntable, take another photo. So you get kind of a ring of photos around that object. You can then move the camera to a higher angle, take another set of photos. And what you end up with is a large number from, taken from, from lots of different angles around the object. Um, it's a very versatile technique. Um, it can be used for a wide range of different subjects. Um, so for smaller stuff, we can use this kind of setup. For very small stuff, we can work with macro lenses, um, take photos of very small objects, but the same technique can be used with sculptures. Um, it can be used with buildings. And obviously in those cases, you're moving the camera around the object rather than moving the object. Um, it can even be used uh, and does get used in archeology span and sort of landscape surveys, that sort of thing, um, where you've got drone-based photography, um, working with very large numbers of images. There are some limitations. Um, dark objects that, uh, when you take the photos, it's difficult to make out any surface detail. Shiny objects because of the reflections. Furry objects just because they're really difficult to kind of get a, a, a for the software to get a real handle on where the surface is. And translucent objects can be difficult. Um, but as I say, the pho photogrammetry is the, the the primary technique that we use for for three D scanning. 
So as I say, the first step in the process is to take the photos. Um, this is a small kind of subset of, of the images that, uh, that I took to produce the 3D model of the wax votive. Um, the model itself was made with about 130 photos altogether. But as you can see, what we're working with is a collection of photos that are taken from lots of different ang ang angles around the object that we're interested in. The next step in the process um, in building this 3D model is to, to put these photos into the piece of software. Um, what that then is then doing, it's looking for features within the object, within the images, that it can recognize across multiple images. Um, and it's using the relative position of those, those features to work out where the photos were taken from relative to each other and relative to the object. So what you can see on the screen now, um, hopefully you can make out in the middle, the starts, uh, the beginning of uh, um, the, the 3D, 3D scan of the votive woman. Each of those blue rectangles represents the position that a photograph was taken from. Um, and what that yields is what's called a sparse point cloud. For obvious reasons, it's clouded points and they're fairly spread out. But hopefully within this, you can start to see the shape of the, the votive woman coming out. Once we're happy with that stage in the process and we've got a sparse point cloud and we've got the, that alignment of the images uh, and we're confident that the software has aligned those correctly, then we can move on to the next stage, which is making the dense point cloud. And at that stage, obviously, we're, we're getting much closer to something that's, that looks like the object that we're working with. Um, I should point out at this stage, um, this might look like it's, it's taken from a photo. Um, this is, uh, a, 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 again, it's a point cloud. If we zoom in on that, you can see how it's still made up of individual points of color, um, where the software has identified a point on the surface of the object. Um, within the software, these, these are just screen grabs from the 3D modeling package. Um, within the software, you know, we can move this around and look at it from all different angles. Um, because of the limitations of Zoom, um, I'm, I'm not going to try that at this stage. I will try and show you the 3D model that you will be able to kind of look at um, out, outside the Zoom call at a later date. So as I say, we, we build the, the dense point cloud. Um, that's the kind of close up view. And then from there, the next stage is to, to build the mesh, as it's called. And well, what that's doing, the software is taking each set of three points, adjacent points, and forming a, a kind of a solid surface. Um, and then once you've produced that surface, it's taking the photography that you've that's used as the starting point, and it's kind of wrapping those photos around that surface. So what you end up with is, um, a digital representation of the object, but then wrapped in the, in the images that you've taken um, to give you kind of a photorealistic model, which hopefully you can see here. Um, so again, this, although it looks very much like the photos, um, this is actually a screen grab of a 3D model. And if I was in the software, we can turn that object around and look at it from different angles. And that's what's called the textured model. Now, obviously, being a solid object, we can't get it to float in, in, in the air to take photos from all angles. So in order to get a complete model, we then have to repeat the process with the second half of the votive. So in this case, we've turned it over, we've produced a second model of the back of the votive. So we've then got a model of the front, model of the back. The next job then is to join them together. Um, what we've got here is a side on view of the the aligned and merged two half models. The way to achieve that is we go through those two half models and identify points on the surface where there's an overlap between the two halves. Um, we identify features that we can recognize on the two halves of the model. We stick a marker on them digitally um, to say this point here on this half of the model corresponds to this point here on the other half of the model. We do that with a number of different points. Um, there's about nine or 10 that I used to, to join the two halves of the votive, um, the votive woman. Um, and then the software uses that to, to align the two halves together. And that brings us to a complete model of the object. 
And as I say, one of the reasons that we do this kind of work, the 3D digitization, is in order to be able to, to kind of share this with a much wider audience. Um, the, the platform that we often use to do that is a website called Sketchfab. Um, you'll find it at sketchfab.com. Um, and if you go on to sketchfab.com and do a search under Exeter Cathedral or University of Exeter Digital Humanities, you'll find your way to, to this and some of the other models that we've produced. Um, I'm just going to try and switch to a different screen and show you the finished photo on Sketchfab. Now, hopefully you can see this. Um, um, as I say, what this allows us to do is we can pick up the model and move it around um, and zoom in on particular features that we're interested in. And it really allows you to kind of study the, the objects a level of detail that would be quite difficult even if you were able to kind of handle the original object. Um, one of the things I find fascinating with the, the votive woman is you can see um, around her waist here, there's a crack that runs all the way around. And it looks as if at some point it's possibly been broken into two pieces um, and has been stuck back together. Um, so it's details like that you can really pick up on. Um, and the detail of her, her, the, her plats, plaited hair on the back um, that Naomi was talking about, um, again, has come out really nicely in the 3D model, and you can get a really good view of that. Um, we do have a couple of other models um, online of the wax votives. Um, I'll just show you those briefly now. As I say, all of these are publicly available on Sketchfab. So if you go to sketchfab.com and do a search for Exeter Cathedral, you should be able to find these. Um, this is one of the, the feet that exist in the collection. Um, and again, you can, you can see quite a lot of detail. Um, another thing that's common that you can see on a lot of them is this sort of seam line around the middle that suggests it was perhaps produced in a mold that came apart in two halves. And that seam might be where the two, two halves met. Um, one of the questions was about, are they hollow? We can see here the sort of the cross section through the outer surface. Um, one of the limitations with photogrammetry um, is that when you're producing models, the software can only put into the model things that it's got clear view of in the photos that you give it. And obviously, um, it's quite tricky to get enough angles of the inside of this foot for it to produce an accurate model of the whole of the inside, which is why it's a bit kind of incomplete um, in the middle there. But you can see how that it was definitely a hollow object. Um, I'm just going to go back out to one more. This one we've recorded, um, it, was, it was written down as being a pig. Um, and the more we've looked at it, the, the less convinced we are that it was actually a pig. Um, it kind of does look pig shaped. Um, there's something that's possibly a snout there. Um, but this is quite an interesting one to, to kind of get people to look at and, and get kind of your views on what you think it might be. Um, we had one of our undergraduate interns who work in the DH lab with us have a look at this. Um, and he sort of aligned it roughly like this. And what, what from that we think it might possibly be is, is some sort of horned animal, possibly an ox, where this would be one of the horns. This would be the animal's left eye. This here would be the sort of top of the nose. And then possibly here where it's broken off, there would be a second eye and then it'd be missing a second horn out this side. Um, but it's really quite hard, hard to tell. Um, but as I say, the, the 3D object, the 3D scan allows us to, to kind of study this object and look at it and, and open it up to a wider audience to, to kind of have a look at and, and give their views on. Sorry, I'm just going to flip back to my PowerPoint presentation. Um, so obviously with um, Sketchfab, the main thing it enables us to do is to share these models with a much wider audience. Um, it also allows models to be embedded into other websites. So, uh, you know, for example, these could be embedded into a project website or the cathedral website. Um, a lot of museums and archives are using 3D um, scanning technology these days. 
and using techniques like this to, to kind of bring these 3D models into their existing websites. Um, because of the limitations of, of working with web, although most people have broadband and fast internet connections these days, it is reduced resolution from the kind of the, the original model that was produced in the, the photogrammetry software. Um, so what you're seeing is a slightly reduced resolution model, um, both in terms of the actual 3D structure um, and the, the sort of the, the photography that's wrapped around it. So what other outputs um, can we get from this 3D scanning process? Um, one of the other key ones that we work with is 3D printing. Um, it allows the creation of surrogates that can be handled so we can produce um, a replica of the original object that we can allow people to handle. Um, you've already already seen, um, I think there are a couple in some of the, the photos that Naomi showed us as part of her presentation. Um, I've got some here. I'm just going to stop my screen share for a second and flick. hopefully this will come back to me on the camera. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if everyone can see me. I can see Rembrandt's name in large across the screen. Oh, excellent. Um, so I'm just gonna hold up to the camera here. So this is one of the 3D prints um, that we've produced from the 3D scan. Um, what I find really interesting with this is quite accidentally, it has broken across the middle in exactly the same place as it looks like the original wax votive was, was also broken. Um, quite by chance, but it does show that there's something in the sort of design and, and, and structure of it that, that kind of leaves that as a weak point. Um, as I say, I find it fascinating that it's broken in exactly the same place. Um, so I'm just gonna go back to my screen share. Okay. Um, 3D prints can be made in a variety of different materials. Um, the, the 3D printers that we have in the DH lab are probably what you call sort of consumer level 3D printers. Um, somebody particularly keen um, could, you know, quite feasibly buy one of these printers for use at home. They're not the sort of really high end printers that can run to sort of tens or even hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and that brings with it certain limitations. Um, they basically print in a single material. So as you'll have seen, excuse me, um, the print I, I was holding up there, it's, it's printed in plastic. Um, it's a single color. The color of plastic that you put in is the color of the model that you get out. Um, but other 3D printers exist that can print in a, a variety of different materials. Um, there are printing technologies out there that can do full color prints now. Um, so it's possible to, to print something that replicates the, the colors of the, the objects, original objects, as well as the shape. Um, there are 3D printers that can print in a wax material. Um, the raw material for that, um, unfortunately, it tends to be a sort of bright blue wax. As far as I can tell, the main reason that the people 3D print in wax is to design objects that they then print in wax um, and then use a, a sort of substitution um, molding process with molten metal. So you pour the molten, molten metal in, that melts the wax, um, and it's, I, I think you sort of pack sand or uh, some other substance around the wax model, pour the molten metal in, that melts the wax, and then leaves the metal in place of the wax. And that seems to be the primary use um, of, of 3D printing in wax. Um, and, you know, obviously that's, um, that means that the wax that you can get is blue, which doesn't really lend itself to what we want here. Um, but this can be just one stage in a process. Um, and as Naomi has already kind of hinted at, one of the things we're looking potentially to do in future is to use one of these 3D prints that we print in plastic to, so we, we produce the scan, from that we get the 3D print, um, from that we can potentially make a mold and from that we can then cast it in whatever material we like. So potentially something we can make that, that recreate the model in beeswax, which brings us to something that's much closer to the original object. And that'd be, that'd be wonderful to be able to do. It'd be fantastic. And I, I really hope that's something we can do. Um, we've had a, a separate project um, working with a local school that did something very similar. Um, they 
there's a there's a statue that's quite well known in Exeter called the Blue Boy, um, and it represents a, a schoolboy um, at a school that used to stand on the the site of the shopping centre in the the centre of Exeter. Um, and they, they asked us to produce a 3D scan of this, which we did. Um, and then within the school in the design and technology department, they, they've got 3D printers there as well. They produced a 3D print of it, uh, produced silicon molds from it, and then they cast them in pewter. So they've got their own little pewter models of the blue boy, um, which they then kind of mount on a mahogany base. And I, I, as I understand it, they, they kind of use them as end of year awards at the school. So it's interesting to see kind of how the scanning and the printing can just be one stage in a process um, that um, you know can lead in lots of different directions. Um, I was going to show briefly um, a video of the the three D printing process. I'll just try and do that very quickly. I'm I'm quite aware that um, we are a little bit short on time, um, so I'm just going to run this quickly and I'll sort of talk over it and let you know what's happening. So hopefully you can see, I don't know how well video comes over on Zoom anyway, um, but what you can see here is um, it's a time-lapse video of the 3D print process for one of these wax votives. Um, the kind of blur at the top is a brass nozzle that the plastic is extruded through um, and it's building up the model a layer at a time. Um, and then the base plate moves down as it completes each layer. Um, what you're seeing here, um, the, the video is about 50 seconds long the actual print took about nine hours. So it's quite a slow process, um, but what you can hopefully see emerging here is the, the sort of recognizable form of the wax votive woman. Um, there's also, you can see there's a few extra bits and pieces printed there. It looks like she's got a bit of a sort of goatee beard. Um, what that actually is, is um, because the print builds up a layer at a time, it can't print onto thin air. Um, so where there are overhangs in, in the shape of the model, um, the software will add in, um, it's kind of like temporary scaffolding. Um, it, will, it will build this extra structure in to allow the higher layers to be printed. Uh, so I'm just gonna switch back to my PowerPoint. Um, and that covers everything I was going to talk about. Um, so thank you very much for listening.